Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel, Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Remember, if you like what I do here, then do please like this video and subscribe to my channel. It really does help me out in YouTube's algorithm and it means that you see my new weekly videos when they're uploaded. Today, I'm going to be looking at John Keats's first published poem, which was published in the Examiner for the 5th of May, 1816. The poem itself was a sonnet called To Solitude, and it appeared amongst the political uh, articles that um, were typical of Lee Hunt's paper, The Examiner. And you can see there that it was sort of pseudo anonymous so the initials were included you can see j k there uh, at the bottom and today i'm going to be focusing on in this short sonnet keats's playful irony and his use of paradox which one runs all the way through the poem now the paradox or the the playfulness um is apparent before you've even read the poem. So you can see just by looking at it that it's 14 lines long, which means that it is a sonnet. And a sonnet, of course, traditionally um, in Italian is a is a is love poetry, it's a form of love poetry. And so there's a kind of playfulness there already from the beginning that you've got a form that's associated with love poetry but the poem itself is about solitude. And you would have thought that solitude, being alone, perhaps even being lonely, really doesn't go hand in hand with a form that is generally, um, that generally celebrates uh, love. And so, you know, the relationships between one and another, whatever it is that they are uh, in love with um, or saying that they love, that could be a person, but of course it could could be a place or several other things but there's a kind of inherent playfulness there just from the form and the title because we know before we've even read the poem that it's to solitude and again there's a there's a sort of playfulness there because it's to so it's addressed to something else so again it's celebrating a kind of relationship that the speaker is writing to something else so there's already a kind of implicit um togetherness or two things communicating with each other which is already sort of against the idea um, or in contrast to um, the idea of solitude and the the paradox that can, continues again into the very opening couple of words and you can see there that they are capitalized to um, make them you know stand out uh, particularly from the very very beginning um, and this sort of capitalization of O solitude highlights um, that the form is also an apostrophe so an apostrophe is a kind of of uh, poem or a kind of writing that is addressed to something as I've already been talking about and as I said that that therefore means that there is already an inherent relationship and sense of communication that is apparent here from the title but also from the very opening apostrophe O solitude so let's get into the actual poem itself then O solitude if I must with thee dwell let it not be among the jumbled heap of murky buildings climb with me the steep nature's observatory whence the dell its flowery slopes its crystal rivers swell may seem a span let me thy vigils keep amongst boughs pavilioned where the deer's swift leap startles the wild bee from the foxglove bell ah oh, fain would i frequent such scenes with thee but the sweet converse of an innocent mind whose words are images of thoughts refined is my soul's pleasure and it sure must be almost the highest bliss of humankind when to thy haunts two kindred spirits flee O oh, solitude if i must with thee dwell so from the very opening of the poem as i've said we've got this apostrophe to solitude so there's the idea of the relationship and then this is sort of backed up and supported by the speaker as well as writing to sort of speaking to solitude saying um i with thee 
It's companionable, the use of the word with there, I with thee. Again, it's sort of paradoxical, really, if we're thinking in terms of solitude, be dwelling with solitude. Those two, those that idea seems incompatible, really. And so we have it here at the opening of the poem. Also, of course, the opening of the octet. And then again, we have this repeated this idea, I with thee at the opening of the sestet. So there are different kinds of sonnets, but um, often the form of a sonnet is in an octet and a sestet. The octet lays out a position, so that's the first eight lines, and then there's a volta or a turn, and the sestet, the final six lines, reflect on the opening eight lines, and that's what happens in this sonnet, which we'll get back to a bit later. But the point here is that the idea of being with, that companionable with, is echoed twice at the beginning of the octet and then again at the beginning of the sestet. Let it not be among the jumbled heap of murky buildings. Climb with me the steep nature's observatory. So here the speaker seeks the animate over the inanimate. Um, and again, we've got the use of the word with, the companionable with. Climb solitude, speaking to solitude, climb with me. So I with thee and now you with me. Um, but this idea of so it doesn't the speaker doesn't want the inanimate kind of buildings, but wants the animate nature, suggesting other life and interrelations, you know, between living beings. Whence the dell, its flowery slopes, its crystal rivers swell, may seem a span. So the word span here, it gives a sense of wideness, a sense of in inclusion, you know, seeing the whole span of nature and, and um, sort of participating in um, in engaging with that whole span of nature rather than, you know, sort of cutting oneself off into a kind of individual isolated unit, which you might think is more appropriate to a poem that is apparently about solitude. Let me thy vigils keep. And there's a really interesting sort of juxtaposition here in the way that me and thy are put together by Keats, the way that Keats chooses to phrase this um, clause here. And it echoes the kind of I with thee of the opening line, me, thy, as if they're kind of yoked together. And it conveys a sense of sort of togetherness between the two. They're joined together, they're side by side, almost hand in hand, you might say. But also there's a very kind of tender intimacy really in the very image of let me thy vigils keep you know some if if someone is keeping a vigil that a vigil that's a sort of sacred um thing that means a lot to the person who's doing it so for somebody else to say you know let me keep them with you is to suggest something quite intimate and quite tender Mongst boughs pavilioned. Um, and just in the use of the word in, Keats, in Keats's choice of diction in using the word amongst, um, so among, you know, that's with other things, again, suggesting a sense of togetherness. To be among boughs pavilioned is different <laughs> from saying, you know, alone in boughs pavilioned. Um, it's sort of encouraging thinking about if you're among something then you're with other things where the deer's swift leap startles the wild bee from the foxglove bell and again we've got the imagery of interactions so we've got nature and living beings interacting with each other the deer the bee and the flower the deer affects the bee affects the flower they're they're put in relationship with each other they're not seen as kind of isolated units they're all um, existing in relationship with each other among amongst nature so 
in the octet overall then there's ironically and sort of paradoxically a real sense of companionability and a tender intimacy with solitude between the speaker and solitude and nature as a whole more generally. We then move on to the sestet and uh, the sestet reflects upon and complicates the previous lines of the octet. So in the octet we'd had this um, ironic and paradoxical companionability with solitude and nature suggested. Um, and here in the sestet we've got a development on that initial position. So the sestet opens are fain would I frequent such scenes with thee. Fain means sort of happily. Um, but you can see that the the lines form is structured very similarly to the first line of the octet. It's got an echo in the form. So we have the apostrophe O solitude and here we have another sort of apostrophe ah, um, and the two exclamation marks there as well. But then you have the I with the repeated, which I mentioned before. The difference here is that the with the has now moved to the end of the line um, and it's sort of drawn upon then in the um, the rhyme. So in the repetitions which come later in with the be kindred spirits flee. But the sweet converse of an innocent mind whose words are images of thoughts refined. So here you've got but this um, this sort of clause opens with but and this is what I was talking about the about the reflection back on what's been said before. So you've had the initial echo of the octet in the sestet in the first lines form and you then have but. So it's it's developing on from what has been said before to say what has been said has been said but now I'm going to say something else and what the speaker says is but the sweet converse of an innocent mind so the the speaker goes even further than kind of companionable solitude and now wants kind of active additional converse so wants conversation wants a kind of active interaction between the speaker and this innocent mind this this other that uh, is being spoken of So, but the sweet converse of an innocent mind whose words are images of thoughts refined is my soul's pleasure, and it sure must be amongst the highest bliss of humankind. Okay, so here we, we've got linked together my soul, so this individual's soul, and humankind. So th this includes, you know, the whole species, the whole kind of humanity. So this is again very paradoxical if we're thinking of this as supposed to be a poem that is about solitude that is about isolation that's about you know an individual uh, feeling sort of solitary instead we've got a, a, a link between the the soul of the speaker and the whole of humankind the whole species and these two seem to be you know in relationship with each other saying that you know my soul feels this and surely this is the highest bliss also of all of humankind it's linking the individual soul with the collective human kind when to thy haunts two kindred spirits flee so now we've got two people and we've got solitude and it seems you know that it, it might be ever ever more really you know first you have one in companionable relationship with solitude and then you have two people in companionable relationship with solitude and then what three and then four and then five and then the whole of humankind um and in the use of the word kindred here keats is kind of drawing um on his use of the word kind in the earlier line so kindred um linking back to human kind um, this idea of uh, of being bonded of being connected of being 
related um, in, in the use of the word kindred. And because it includes kind and goes back to humankind, it sort of brings in the idea that all of humankind might feel this kindred spirit. And this idea of expansion is kind of played on, I think, in um, in the in the very sort of fabric of the poem in terms of the the repetitions and the deviations in some sense. So we've had the the I with the repeated, but here we've got a kind of inverted repetition. So me thy, which I was talking about earlier, in the kind of tender intimacy of let me thy vigils keep, and then here you've got it uh, sort of reflected and inverted with thy two. So me, thy, thy too, as if it goes from the individual with solitude and then another and then another, perhaps, until you end up um, with all of humankind. So the the idea and the imagery that I was talking about just a moment ago is also reflected on a kind of foundational grammatical level in the way that Keats structures the lines structures the lines form. So in the whole sonnet then there's a fundamental irony, a fundamental paradox which is that this is not really a poem about solitude at all, it's a poem about humankind, it's a poem about kindred spirits, plural, it's about converse, it's about togetherness, it's about companionability. Thank you for listening. If you like what I do here on my channel, then do please click the thumbs up button and subscribe. Subscribing means that you'll see more of my weekly videos, close reading, classic literature.